You know, I was um, thinking, I had a message in my mind last night, and that message still hasn't left my mind, but I just wondered if the timing would be correct in preaching that message this morning. And there's another message that's kind of like the one last night, but it has more, I guess, honestly, it would have more of a, of a focus on uh, missions. Now, you said we've heard a lot of missions the last couple of days. I know that our missionary was here. I'll tell you what, he was on fire for missions. But you know, this is a different kind of a mission I'd like to speak on this morning. Not necessarily a mission, foreign country, or even a foreign culture. But, a, uh, but every one of us is a missionary of sorts. And I'd like to turn it over to Proverbs chapter 29. Proverbs chapter 29, <clears throat> and I'm going to read one verse of scripture there, just one verse. Proverbs chapter 29 and verse 18, I'm sure some of us could even quote it. Where there is no vision, the people perish, but he that keepeth the law, happy is he. I want to focus on that first portion of that scripture Where there is no vision, people perish. Father, as we come to you this morning, we do thank you for the privilege. Lord, the opportunity of being in your house, in your presence. We thank thee, Lord, for thy spirit that we've sensed during the course of this encampment. We thank you, Lord, that you've seen fit to visit us with a special visitation. And Lord, we believe that there is so much more that you would long to do for us. And Lord, we we pray that as we bask in the glow of thy presence and thy joy unspeakable, that, Lord, we would never lose our vision of our real purpose, Lord, and that is to win souls for the kingdom of heaven. We love you this morning, Father, and we pray that you would help us to do our very best, Lord, to, to do more, amen, to be a positive influence Lord, on the world round about us, that they might see Jesus through us. Lord, we we love thee for it, and we pray that you would give us anointing and unction this morning. Quicken our minds and our thoughts, Lord, and, and Lord, stir our heart, we pray, by the Holy Ghost, that we might go forward, O God, and win souls ere it's everlastingly too late. And we're praying in Christ Jesus' holy name, amen. And amen. You know, I suppose this morning that everyone else is like me. (laughs) Somewhat. Not a lot, probably, thankfully. You probably look at me this morning and say, I'm sure glad I don't look like you. Amen. Well, you're pretty fortunate in that regard. But uh, uh, I, I was thinking this morning, Humanity has certain traits and maybe even quirks and nuances that are quite predictable, if you will. Um, You know, I I think this afternoon, in some ways we all think the same. Some ways we all act the same. After all, it's just a trait of being a human being. And you know, I suppose in the reading of Scripture, Some of us, now there are some of us that are brighter minds than others, no doubt. But when it comes to reading scriptures, most of us, when we've read a scripture, the first inclination as to the interpretation of that scripture that comes to mind, we have a tendency to just go with that interpretation or that thought. You know, sometimes if we're not really sure what it means, maybe we'll get a Maybe we'll get a commentary or a concordance or something and we'll just look up and we find some idea of what we believe that scripture means. And, and we never really stray from that unless we're acted upon by a, a stronger outside force. And we have a tendency to set things in our mind as, as being truth once we've recognized them. And it well may be truth, but sometimes because we have our eyes or our mind made up and our eyes set on that certain truth, we we don't have a tendency to let our mind stray beyond that 
particular point. And that's why so many times when you read the Bible, you'll read something and you've probably read it before, maybe a hundred times, and, and then suddenly you read something and you say, why didn't I ever see that before? I mean, it's always been there. I don't understand that. Amen. And you know, this scripture was kind of like that to me, where there is no vision, the people perish. And for a long time, I just, I just took it at face value. I don't know about you, but face value for me would just simply mean I see a picture in my mind of, of a church that's visionless, a visionless church, a church that really doesn't look beyond the four walls of its own existence, a church that really is unconcerned and uncompassionate, and, and I can see them beyond the shadow of the steeple around the outside. There's a lost and a dying world that's slipping out into eternity and, and being lost. Pretty good interpretation, I think. I don't think there's anything wrong with that interpretation. And you know something, I think sometimes we need to be reminded of that interpretation. I think there's sometimes that we need to be reminded that there's a lost and a dying world out there that are dying all around us and, and they're going to hell and, and, we're, and we have the, the only remedy for sin that there is in the world and yet we seem so satisfied just to let them slip through our fingers. That bothers me a little bit. And you know, I... I myself have been sort of guilty. Years ago, in, in my first pastorate, I used to live across the road from a large and a growing cemetery. And uh, that cemetery was growing. In fact, you know, usually it would receive two or three <coughs> uh, new subscribers a day. I mean, I remember waking up in the early morning, Brother, brother, uh, uh, brother Dalton, I'd wake up in the early morning, and window up, and I could hear the, the sound of taps being played. Well, that's a mournful sound to wake up to. And I would look out there, and there would be a full military funeral. Maybe the rifles going off as a seven-gun salute was being given up. There have been many times when I've looked out, there would be a procession of cars as they came by. I've even seen them, you know, when a dignitary in the fire department passed away. I can remember, you know, them coming there and putting their big ladders up in the air and forming a tunnel or a cross of ladders, amen, for that, for that, bear, for that deceased one to be, to be carried under to bury and given, given honors there in that funeral home. And as I said, we lived right across from the funeral home, and so, you know, the only, the only scenic view that I had sitting on my front porch was in a graveyard. And I would sit out there, and you know, I've got a vivid imagination, and I would sit out there, and as I sat out there, <laughs> as I sat out there, I would just find myself sinking down into the depths of despair. And my wife would say to me, she said, why are you sitting out there? She said, why don't you just come on in the house if it's going to bother you that much? And then I thought one day, why does it bother me so much? Why am I so bothered by, by the graveyard? Why am I so bothered seeing funeral processions and crying and sobbing and final goodbyes and holes and dirt and flowers? Why am I so bothered by that? You know, as a preacher, I had the wrong idea. I'll be honest. I was bothered because it, let, it, 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 it caused me to contemplate my own soon coming demise. And that's why it bothered me. Your day's coming. One of these days, they're going to put you down in the hole in the ground. They're going to bury you. You're going to be gone. And that's what bothered me the most, was that it, it reminded me of my own mortality. And I realized that sooner rather than later, I'm probably going to make a visit to the graveyard myself if Jesus Christ tarries. Now, I don't know if that bothers you or not, but it ought to. And I tell you, Paul said the last enemy to be conquered will be death. Death is not a friend to you and I. Amen. I realize that we're going to have to die to go to heaven. I understand that this afternoon, but I'm not exactly rejoicing to experience the experience of death. After all, there are things that uh, I enjoy, and there are people that I love here. 
There's been many times when I've had to face that inevitably I'm going to die and maybe I'm going to die sooner than I want to now and, and I'm laying sick on a hospital bed and the worst thought in my mind is that I'm going to leave my wife behind. And I don't want to do that. I want you to know for those of you that have lost a spouse, you have my wholehearted sympathy. I can't even hardly allow the thought to cross my mind. It would be enough to drive me over the edge when I'm reminded of the vulnerability of humanity. And I've got two sons, and I think, oh God, I couldn't imagine what it would be like to have to bury one of my sons. If you've ever buried a child, I want you to know you have my wholehearted sympathy. It breaks my heart this afternoon to think that my sons, uh, a man, would die. And friend, that just bothers me to no end. But you know, one day I begin to get my eyes open a little bit. And the Lord began to say the real tragedy here, son, is not death itself. Amen. And I begin to see things in a different light. Amen. I begin to see those not just as people that were lost or humanity that had died. But all of a sudden, friend, it just began to strike me very, very strongly. Though it should have been an elementary thought and it should have been something that was at the forefront of my mind all the time. But it came to my realization that for everyone that's put beneath that sod, it doesn't end there. But friend, they're in eternity somewhere. And the sad part is the vast majority of them have probably made their bed in hell. And I want to tell you that bothers me even more this afternoon. Oh, it, it bothers me that I might lose my wife or I might lose a son. Amen. Or we've lost loved ones. It bothers me. But friend, the Bible said it's appointed unto man once to die and after this the judgment. And I want to tell you something, friend, somewhere there's a soul that's facing the judgment of God. There's a soul out there in eternity. Amen. And they're spending that eternity somewhere. And beloved, it began to dis, dis dawn on my mind. Death shouldn't bother bother me nearly as much as the thought of an eternal soul out there, amen, somewhere in the eternal realm of things, amen, receiving their eternal reward. When I begin to think on eternity and on hell, I want you to know it's more than my mind can comprehend, more than my mind can fathom. Friend, I want to tell you, if we as a church if we ever lose our vision of a lost and a dying world and souls uh, that aren't just being buried beneath the sod, but souls that are going out into eternity, amen, without hope and without God, uh, I want to tell you something, beloved. We'll just continue to lose the huddled masses as long as it no longer bothers us. I thought of what our dear missionary friend made the statement a couple of times when he was here. He said, I wish hell didn't exist. I want to tell you, friend, I would never question the integrity of the authority, uh, amen, or the intelligence of God. God knew exactly what he's doing, and he knew what was best. But I tell you, in my mind, I wish I could say there was no hell. I wish there wasn't a hell. I wish that we were just like animals if we weren't prepared to meet God and just went out, uh, amen, and there was nothing less. I wish it was that. I'll be honest, but God knows what's best. But, beloved, that's not how it is. Amen. There is a hell this afternoon. A literal place where souls are going to go if they're unprepared to meet God. And I tell you, friend, if that doesn't stir the church and cause us to get a vision, I don't know what would. Certain atheists made a statement, if I really believed there was a hell, I would crawl on my knees from coast to coast, crying out, amen, trying to warn those that were going there. I think of that this afternoon. I wonder how often we've cried out warning, amen, to a lost and a dying world about hell. People being there for all eternity. It's more than my mind can imagine. But I remember Leonard Ravenhill, he made a statement. He said the fact that all men are judgment bound is the most troubling thought I can think. Every one of us is going to stand before the judgment bar of God. And that is a troubling thought this afternoon, friend. I want to tell you something. The church is going to have to have a vision. We're going to have to get our eyes open, amen, in a spiritual sense and begin to look, oh God, around about us. It's not just, uh, it's not just strangers that are on their way to hell. 
It's not just uh, those that we're unaware of that are slipping out across the line of worlds going to the judgment. No, friend, but many of them are our own friends and family members. Many of them heard the same gospel that we've heard. Many of them attained the same church that we attended. Many of them, amen, have felt the same conviction that you and I have felt. And some of them indeed, friend, uh, have experienced some of the same experiences of salvation that we have felt. But yet they turn their back on God and now they're out there and they're lost and it seems as if there's no drive and there's no desire for them to get back to God and that bothers me I tell you the thought bothers me I've got two boys that are unsaved I don't know how I would ever live with myself if one of them ever made their bed in hell I don't know how I could I don't know how I could live with that I want to tell you something God would have to give me grace he'd have to do something to my mind Hey man, because I want to tell you something, friend. My mind from that point on would be full of hell. And I've made this statement before, and I'll make it again. If I should, by God's grace, make it to heaven. And one of my boys made their bed in hell. I can tell you, friend, God would have to wash that memory from my mind completely for me to be able to enjoy the splendors of heaven. Because from that point on, heaven would have a little hell in it. And it would be in my mind and in my thoughts constantly. And I tell you this this afternoon, friend. You and I, I believe God. We need to pray that God, the Holy Ghost, once again begins to settle down upon us. Amen. And open our eyes to the reality of what it really means to be lost eternally. Do you hear me this afternoon? I want to tell you, I don't think we really grasp it anymore. Amen. Our, our senses, uh, amen, have gotten so deadened in this day and age. Uh, there's so much tragedy and, and there's so much uh, uh, on, on media and we're bombed bombarded constantly by horrific things and it's just it's just deadened our senses if you want to know there was a time in our country and culture when if we would have heard some of the things that we're hearing over our news waves it would have caused us to go into a blind panic it would have caused us to just uh, fall over being so overwhelmed with despair now friend it barely catches our attention it's one thing right after the other Amen. Some people say, well, we've got to keep up with the news. I'm going to tell you, there's a lot in that old Saul, ignorance is bliss. There's some things I just don't need to know anymore. Amen. Because it has a tendency to deaden our conscience. It has a tendency to deaden our grasp of reality. And I tell you this this afternoon, it's why the television set is one of the biggest, one of the biggest scourges in the United States of America. Our young people from the very earliest of age, God help you if you're a holiness person and have a television set and fill your home with Hollywood. My Jesus in heaven. I want to tell you something, friend. God would save you from Hollywood. It's not a holiness issue. Amen. And yet they'll bring it into the home and they'll begin at an early age, you know, to bombard the senses of those little kids. Just set them there. Amen. In front of that television set. Amen. And they get all of the garbage and the rubbish from Hollywood packed in their mind and, and seeing all the murders and all the rapes and all the things, uh, amen, that are depicted there. And beloved, I want to tell you something. They think it may not have an effect, but it has an effect. We're living in a generation that's been deadened to the sting of death. Amen. That's why it's easy for some of these uh, young people to take a gun and go in and start blazing away and kill without regard or remorse. Amen. That's why. Because our senses have been deadened. Amen. To the reality of tragedy and death. We witness it every day over the television waves. Well, amen. You don't have to shout me down. Well, amen. I want to tell you something. By the time some of our children are six or seven years old, they've seen things that are unspeakable. And I'm not talking about people that we're not aware of. I'm talking about our own grandchildren in a lot of regards. I thought how sad it is. We tried to keep our children away from those things. Amen. And they get away from God and the first thing they do is want to bring one of those trashy things in the house and set your grandchildren down in front of it. Amen. Amen. Well, they don't cry and they don't fuss because their little eyes and their little minds amen are just drawn to that thing and they begin to absorb. Amen. They absorb more from the television set than they do with time with mommy and daddy. 
I don't know how I got here, but I'm here this morning. Hey, man, I got a little grandson. He was born May the 8th, bless his heart. And I got a son, a backslidden holiness preacher. And he and his wife, one time, both had a good experience with God. But they got bitter about some things, backslid. And he went and got himself a great big old television, a huge one, covers the whole wall of his house. Well, Dad, I just want to get it to watch football games on. Yeah, right. Hey, man, you go over there, and they said, boy, it's just amazing. Now, this little baby was just born May the 8th, so you know how old he is. They said, it's just amazing. He'll just sit there very quietly and sit, and that screen's on, and he'll just sit there for hours just looking at that screen. I'm talking about an infant. I thought, my God in heaven, what's already that little mind absorbing? Hey, man, and the older he gets, the more he'll absorb. Hey, man, and beloved, if you allow the television set to train your children, hey, man, they'll, they'll be against everything that you're for. Amen. They'll be okay with homosexuality. They'll be okay with transgenderism. They'll be all right with uh, premarital sex and rape and murder. Amen. That's why our culture is going to hell in a handbasket, if you will. It's because we've been trained by the television set to accept these very things. Amen. I want to tell you as holiness people, we ought to cry out. I tell you, we ought to look at our children and say you ought to be ashamed of yourself. Amen. You were raised up with a good mind and a pure mind. Amen. You weren't exposed to that. And yet a generation later, your grandchildren, listen, they're being raised as heathen, and some of them wouldn't know how to get saved if they wanted to. Well, I got off track this morning. But I want to tell you something. This bothers me. And I want to tell you, friend, if we don't get a vision, amen, of souls that are lost, Amen. If we don't get a vision of the direction, amen, that our, that our holiness culture is heading, I want to tell you something, friend. We're not going to last very long. God help us this afternoon. But you know, I was reading this scripture sometime later, and the Holy Ghost opened my mind, and he said that scripture goes a lot deeper than your first thoughts. He said, because where there is no vision, the people perish. Because where there is no vision, the church vision has perished. The vision of the church is no more. Why is that? Because the church is also perished. They have no vision because they've died as well. There is no vision. Why? One dead entity <laughs> looking at another that is dying. Does that make sense to you? Where there is no vision, the people perish. And the reason for their loss of vision is because they as well have perished. You know, we admit it. How many revivals do you have during the course of a year at your church? Sadly, since COVID, some of them don't have any yet. But did you realize that we, we admit we're in need of revival? What does that mean, Brother Maley? What's revival mean? To revive. If I come down here in front of you and I fall over, what do I need? I need revived. Amen. And the church said, we need revival. We need revival. We need revival. Are we admitting that we're already dead? You know, one of the surest signs that you're dead is that you can no longer see. I'll never forget back in April of 2008, my brother and I walked out along a cut cornfield and into a little hardwoods, and we were looking for my daddy who'd been disappeared. He'd disappeared for about 20 hours. And my brother and I, we made our way over there and walked over in a woods there, open woods, you know, beautiful woods in the early springtime. We stepped over a log, and there lay the remains of my daddy, Best friend I ever had. And I'll never forget it, friend. I tell you, death's an ugly thing. He died suddenly of a massive heart attack. His neck was swollen. His skin had turned black and dark blue. He was unrecognizable as far as color was concerned. His body had turned a complete different color from his neck up. He had a trickle of blood running out of his mouth where he'd had a massive heart attack. He'd been gone in just an instant of time fell flat on his face, little shovel sticking in the ground behind him, and a half of a sack of ramps that he'd been digging. He went to heaven that suddenly. It was an ugly thing. I want to tell you something, friend, it broke my heart to this day. I'll never be able to get that vision out of my mind of what death looked like. My brother, who's a backslidden holiness preacher, was standing there with me, tears just pouring down our face. And I knelt down, Brother Rick, Rich, beside Dad, and I rolled him up on his side. 
And I began to peel the dried leaves off of his face that had stuck there over the night. Tears pouring down my face. I want you to know something. I was as broken as a man could possibly be. But I tell you, beloved, I wouldn't have brought him back for anything. But you know something, friend? In spite of all of my tears and sobbing and sorrow, in spite of all those that begin to show up and make their way over into that little hardwoods to behold my daddy, the ambulances that came and the, and the fire trucks that came and, and all the medical personnel that came. And I was there and I was rummaging through his pocket and, and there was the cell phone and I pulled out that little old flip phone and I looked at it and there were 27 unanswered calls. And, and we pulled out his big old wallet. He had a wallet that was like a rock. We teased him about it. It was so full he had to hold it together with rubber bands. And it had everything from paper clips to band-aids in it. Mostly anything but what it should have held, money. Took that out of his pocket. But you want to know something, friend? Dad didn't care. As we stood there and cried, Dad didn't care. There was something that stuck in my mind was those hazel eyes that my dad had. They were still open. He had died so quickly. Rich, I took my hands and I went over and I put my fingers against his eyelids and I pulled them down for the final time. And dad didn't care. They brought a body bag. The coroner stood there and pronounced him dead. They brought a body bag. They opened it up. They put him inside the body bag and zipped the body bag. They carried him to the ambulance. And from there to the mortician, but Dad didn't care. You say, why, Brother Maley? Because he was dead. Nothing bothered him anymore. The most horrific of scenes could have flashed before those open eyes, and they wouldn't have mattered one iota because Daddy was dead. Could I tell you this afternoon, friend, in a spiritual sense, we've gotten to the place where it doesn't bother us anymore. It doesn't trouble us anymore. It's as if we can't see. Our eyes are wide open. It's because the church has died, beloved. Can I tell you this afternoon, I don't want to be, be one that tells sad tales or sad stories, but I want to tell you we're going to have to take some things at face value. The church is dying before our very eyes. Amen. And I pray, oh God, I pray, God, that you would continue to help men like Brother Case that are crying out against it. He's one of the few that I've heard crying out. Hey, we're going to have to do something, people. We're dying. We're dying. We're dying. And, beloved, we have loved ones that are going to hell all around us. We don't even see them anymore. And our eyes are wide open, but yet it seems like we don't even comprehend what we're seeing. <laughs> and I tell you this afternoon, I would that God Amen. Would wash our spiritual eyes once again. Amen. And give us sight and give us vision. Amen. Awaken the church from her slumber. I believe God's wanting to help us when his spirit comes. I'm praying, oh God, may this be that awakening. Amen. May from this point on, oh God, you just continue to shake us and awaken us to the plight. Amen. Of this world that's round about us. <laughs> You say, Brother Maley, I see. I can see. I see them out there, lost in a dying world. And I tell you something, friend. You say you see in the physical, but are you really seeing in the spiritual? I remember some years ago, I was pastoring, as I said, there in the southern tip of Ohio, near the town of Ironton, Ohio. We passed by there frequently on old Route 52. As we made our travels many times over to Ashland, Kentucky, or various places, Huntington, West Virginia. And I'll never forget it. My boys were young. And uh, as we would drive up and down that highway, I can remember many times walking along that highway, there was an old man. I can see him in my mind's eye just as clearly as if he's here. He had an old tattered pair of bibbed overhauls on. He wore them year-round, I think. They were dirty and filthy and covered with soot from the many fires that he frequented. He lived there somewhere on the Ohio River bank around a campfire. I can remember his long white hair that hang down to his shoulders. I remember his long white beard that hang down to his, hung down to his waist. And that beard and that hair were soot blackened from years of being unwashed and unkempt. And he would many times be dragging a burlap sack behind him as he walked down the highway. 
That burlap sack would be full of tin cans, aluminum, different bits of metal that he could find that he might take down to the recycling center to make a few cents to live on. And he was quite a spectacle in our area. You know how rumors are, they always crop up. Oh, they say that man's filthy rich. He chooses to live that way. You couldn't prove it by me. But my boys were just little at that time. And he kind of began one of those things that they kind of looked for when we went up the highway that way. And most times you would look over on one side or the other of that four lane, and there he would be, dragging his burlap sack. And my boys would say, oh, Daddy, there's that man. There he is. And they would watch him as he went by. I many times have seen him myself. I was in a supermarket one time going through the checkout line. And as I went through the line, I was standing there with a few things and a couple of customers behind me. I looked back, and there stood that dirty old man. He was carrying on conversation with someone else that was in line. And I was kind of shocked, Brother Dalton. He had very intelligent speech. As a matter of fact, he came across as quite a smart man. And he was talking just as normally as anyone else. The only thing you couldn't really get a grip on was his exterior. I kind of got a different look at him from that point on. After all, now I'd heard his voice and I'd heard his words and I knew that he wasn't mentally challenged. Sometime after that, I was on my way to a revival meeting. I had to take that way. And as I drove that highway, I was sitting there, no doubt thinking of my next meeting. And I looked over, and there was that man as he walked down the highway. What came to my mind? There he is again. But you know, that day I had a visitor in the car with me. I didn't have kids to distract my attention. didn't have my wife there to talk to me. The blessed Holy Ghost slipped up in the car beside me. And he said, son, I want you to know something. I died for the likes of him. Could I tell you something, friend? It did something to my heart right then and there. I want to tell you it struck me to the deepest of my soul. There I saw. And what was he? Oh, he was just some sort of a sideshow. He was just some sort of a freaky attraction. He was just something of an amusement to a community and a sense of wonderment. But I wondered if anybody had ever seen him as a soul. I wondered if anyone had ever seen him as Jesus Christ saw him. Of all the many churches that are in that area, I wondered if anyone had ever talked to him about his soul. I want to tell you something, friend. That bothered me this afternoon. I wondered if anybody had ever mentioned his name in the throne room of grace. If anybody had ever prayed, amen. If anybody had ever thought they would seek him out and talk to him about Jesus Christ. I wonder if anyone had ever done that. I want to say, oh God, would you open my spiritual eyes? Would you help me to see would you help me to see? Could I tell you this afternoon, friend, it really, it really began to trouble me, and I began to think of Jesus Christ. And I think, uh, I think there when he said to the disciples, uh, I must needs go by Samaria. And there we find Jesus as he's sitting there on the well. Hey, man, and there came a woman. Hey, man, to talk to him, and his disciples had gone away to buy bread. And, that, and he's sitting there, and that woman comes. And he begins to talk to her about her soul. And the story said that when his disciples returned, they marveled that he would speak to such a one as her. You say, why, Brother Maley? Because she was a harlot. She was a homewrecker. She was despised and rejected. They say the reason that she came to the well in the middle of the day was because the other women folk, amen, she'd been such a homewrecker, she was likely to be mistreated. And so she came in the middle of the day when she would be left alone. But Jesus was there. Could I tell you, he didn't see a harlot, he didn't see a homewrecker, but he saw a precious soul that had a need. I say, oh God, help me to begin to see through the eyes of Christ. Oh God, if you can scrape the scales off of my physical eyes and help me to see with spiritual eyes those that are around about me. Oh God, I'm afraid I've become too satisfied to let souls slip by me. Amen. On their way, uh, that slippery slope to hell on their way. I want to tell you something, friend, that bothers me this afternoon. I thought when Jesus made that trip to the Gadarenes, knowing full well that he would be despised and rejected of that country and that culture, but there was a demonic in the tombs. Amen. And Jesus dealt with those demons. Amen. And found that demonic there. Amen. Sitting at the feet of Jesus and in his right mind, a follower of Jesus Christ and no doubt to become a disciple and a preacher of the word. 
Amen. And they constrained him to leave their coast. Get away! You've messed around with our almighty dollar. Amen. You've messed around with our agriculture. Amen. But I tell you something Jesus didn't see. Amen. A public scourge. He didn't see a jailbird. Amen. He didn't see someone that was unfit for society. But he saw a precious soul. He saw what man could not see. I want to tell you something, friend. Christ sees things that you and I don't see. If we would just allow him to open our spiritual eyes. My mind goes to blind Bartimaeus sitting by the wayside begging. And when he heard Jesus was to come that way, he began to cry out, Thou son of David, have mercy on me. What about that crowd all around him, Brother Maley, whom he was depending on for his living? It said they constrained him to be quiet. Hey man, be quiet, be quiet. You say, why, Brother Maley? Because they saw him as a welfare case, a public menace and a scourge. That's what they saw him as. But I want to tell you something. Jesus Christ saw him as a precious soul. I don't believe he went down that road, down the Jericho Road, for no good reason, Brother Case. I believe he knew exactly where Bartimaeus was, and he saw his need, and he saw a hungry heart. When's the last time you've gone out of your way? Amen. Because you knew of a need, and you knew of a hungry heart. Amen. I would that God would open up our spiritual eyes tonight uh, and help us to begin to see souls that are lost all around us. I tell you, the church has become so 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 dilatory, amen, and so blinded. I want to tell you, friend, we're not, we're not moving anymore beyond the four walls of the tabernacles, amen. We're not concerned. We're just satisfied for it to be our little crowd, amen. But I want you to know, friend, that's a sure recipe for disaster in the church, amen. When you get your, verse, your gaze inverted, instead of looking at a lost and a dying world, you'll pick one another to death and your church will suffer and it will fail well, God help us this afternoon I say God help me I say oh God help me to get my eyes open in this hour we see them brother Bailey we see them we see them we see them out there in the shopping malls we see them in everyday life do you really comprehend what you some years ago I read a story it's quite an amazing story in Reader's Digest, I believe it was. If you don't read that, that's between you and God. I haven't read it for years just because I haven't had it available. But there were some interesting stories in Reader's Digest. At least there were several years ago. But I was reading a story in Reader's Digest about a man who had been born blind. Blind or he had gone blind shortly after birth, I forget. But at any rate, he had no recollection of ever having had any sight. He was born completely blind. He lived his life. He went to a school for the blind. He went to college for the blind. He had a career in the blind for the, in, 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 while being blind. He'd married a wife while he was blind, had a family while he was blind. He had actually, I believe, retired while he was blind. You know, the advances in technology in this day and age are amazing, especially in the medical field. And he made a trip, I don't know, it was to an optometrist or an, optometrist or an ophthalmologist. <clears throat> And the doctor said to him, he said, sir, he said, due to advances in medicine, you may not believe this, but he said, I can do an operation on you and you'll have 20-20 vision. You talk about a shock. I mean, that would be amazing. He said, would you like to have this surgery? Well, of course. <laughs> hey, man, that's wonderful. <sighs> you know, and they begin to plan this surgery that he was to have. And this is a true story. And uh, they were planning this surgery and, uh, you know, I, you know, my mind, I begin to wonder what that must have been like the days leading up to that surgery. I wonder what his wife was thinking. He's going to be able to see me for the very first time. I better lose a little weight. I wonder what he was thinking. I wonder what my wife's going to look like. Oh, my. What's she going to look like? I wonder what his children thought. Dad's going to see us for the very first time. Will he know us? Hey, man, a lot of things to think. He had his surgery, and they said for a few days he had to wear patches over his eyes. And so the fateful day came, and they invited the entire family. They said, when Dad sees for the first time, we want to be the first ones he looks at. And so he came to the doctor's office that day. The doctor first peeled one of those stickers off of his eyes, and then the other, and of course he had his eyes tightly closed. And he opened his eyes very quickly, and he closed his eyes. 
And well, that's pretty natural, you know, because of the brightness of the light that he'd never seen before. And, you know, if you've been sleeping and all of a sudden somebody shines a black light in your eyes, you know, that's, that's pretty rough. It's fun, too, if you have a younger brother. Amen. <sighs> Don't you dare try it on your dad, because my boys have done that to me. <sighs> and so he opened his eyes again for a little longer that time, and he closed he opened his eyes again, and he looked around, tried to look around for a little bit. He closed his eyes. Oh, my head, my head, my head. The story went on. There was no happy end. As a matter of fact, the story went on and said that he spends most of the time in this life with his eyes closed in a cloak of secure darkness. You say, why, Brother Maley? Because sight wasn't enough. His eyes were 20-20. The doctors would tell you his eyes were working just like your eyes and my eyes. He would look out there and his eyes would pick up that object. Now they tell me the way the brain operates. They say that when you look at something, you actually see it upside down. You didn't know it, but you're upside down. It's amazing. You're still in your pew. <clears throat> but they say once that, once, that, once that vision has been transferred into your eyes, through your retina, it is taken to your brain. And then your brain flips it right side up. And then comprehends it in a right side up position. Now all the time you thought you were right side up, but you were upside down. Thinking that you were upside down, but right side up. And so this man, who had never seen anything in his life, with an adult's mind, with an adult's comprehension, he opened his eyes for the very first time, and his eyes were seen. And telling his brain what he was seeing. But his brain was not comprehending what he was seeing. It was an information overload. More than that human computer could comprehend or take. And it led to massive headaches. You say, Brother Maley, how is that? It was simple. It was because he hadn't learned as an infant. Do you realize that's what I said? Television is such a dangerous thing. Our infants learn in little increments. When they open their eyes for the very first time, they're seeing very little. We're having the, the experience of going through that again in our life with our first grandchild. And he looks around, and for a long time, you can tell he didn't even know what he was looking at. But then there came a day when he began to fix his gaze on different things. And then his eyes begin to follow you. Amen. And he began to get more motor skills and more cognitive. You could tell it. And he began to recognize faces. And he would smile when he saw certain ones that he recognized. He, he, he could recognize that bottle. Amen. He could recognize that mommy. He could, even at an early age. But you see, it wasn't just jammed into his mind all at one time. Amen. And so he has to grow to learn what the different colors are. And he has to learn what the different fibers and fabrics. Uh, amen. And all the atoms, all that atoms comprise uh, in this life. He'll have to learn what grass is. He'll have to learn what homes are. He'll have to learn what background and color and all those things are. His brain has to learn it in little increments of time. But to take a grown man and all of a sudden introduce to his brain all those things that he knows nothing about makes him more comfortable to live in a state of blindness. You say, what's that got to do with us, Brother Maley? A lot. Folk, I want to tell you something. Rather than us comprehend a lost and a dying world all around us, and getting overwhelmed, amen, by the lack of labors in a harvest field that is so large. It's easy for us to just keep our spiritual eyes closed, amen, and just sit on our hands and wait for the return of Christ or for death to take us without having any concern. We try not to let the thought of hell bother our mind. We try not to let the thought of eternity, amen, get to us too much. Amen, we know it's there, but we just as soon avoid it. Amen, we don't really want to get a vision of it. Amen, it's more comfortable. Amen, because our minds just can't comprehend. Amen, and we just don't want want it to comprehend any longer. Just close your eyes. It's more than we can stand, Brother Maley. You say, how do you know it's true, Brother Maley? When our dear brother missionary was here, how many of you got a sense of feeling uncomfortable as he talked about all the things at his age 
that he's doing and all the things that he's involved in and how diligently and how hard he's working and how the needs are to be met and how there's finances and all those things. And as I sat there, I thought, God, I'm glad you made me an evangelist. I'd be overwhelmed by all that stuff. But, oh, friend, I'm afraid that the reason we're overwhelmed by it, amen, is because we just don't want to look at it. We don't want to comprehend it. Amen, in a sense, it's laziness if you want to know. That's too big of a job, Brother Mahaley. I really don't want to comprehend it. Friend, I want to tell you something. You and I have no conscious idea of how big our job is in this day and age in which we live. And it's getting bigger all the time. I want to tell you, friend, we can't afford to lay down. Could I tell you something? If I did what the devil wanted me to do, I'd be laying there on my couch in Grafton, West Virginia. You're not able to do that. You're not physically able to get out there and preach and scream in the 90 degree temperatures. You're just not up to that. But I want to tell you something, friend. If I die, I'll die with my boots on, so help me God. Amen. I tell you, friend, I refuse to lose a soul. I realize tonight that there are certain souls that I'm accountable for winning into the kingdom of heaven. Amen. And I will not have their blood dripping off of my fingers at the judgment bar of God. Where there is no vision, the people perish. Because where there is no vision, the church has already perished. Could I share this with you? And I don't want to hold you long. But I do want to finish this truth this afternoon. There's a third meaning to that. Where there is no vision, the people perish. Because where the people have perished, there is no vision. You say, what does that mean, Brother Maley? I'll read it to you. Over in the third chapter of 1 Samuel. We find there in the child Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli. And the word of the Lord was precious in those days. And there was no open vision. The word of the Lord was precious in those days. And there was no open vision. You say, Brother Maley, what's that got to do with this a lot? Let me dissect maybe that scripture. The child Samuel ministered in those days. He was just a boy when he'd gone to live in the temple. We know the story. And he was ministering before the Lord. God was speaking to Samuel. And it says there that the word of the Lord was precious in those days. Can I ask you this afternoon, does anybody know what the word precious means? Amen. Some of you may have heard me preach this before. I don't know. Amen. Anybody ever heard me preach this? Nobody. That's good. What's the word precious mean? Your lunch will wait. Amen. What's it mean? Precious. Boy, we hold that little baby. Isn't that precious? Amen. If there was a little baby, I'd come down and get it and hold it in my arms and preach this precious. Amen. Some of the little babies that I held, one of the little babies that held in my arms is a big girl now. But she was little and she was precious. What's that mean? We all say it, but we really don't comprehend what it means. Precious. Well, let me ask you a question. You know, there are many words that we use like that in our vocabulary. What does the word is mean? I-S. You've used it today. I know you have. Is. Is. Anybody know what is means? You know, one of our former presidents, when he was under, <clears throat> when he was under scrutiny, he confounded some of the brightest minds, amen, in our government, twisting them up in their words, own words by asking them, well, now that depends on what your definition of the word is is. Amen. Is, are, was, were, am, is denotes existence, denotes place. <clears throat> this is the tabernacle. What about the word if? Use that a lot. I was preaching that one time and I said, do you know what the word if means? And I really didn't know. Hey Amen, I'm glad God bailed me out. But you know what if means? It means on condition. It denotes condition. If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways. If, it's condition. Well, you know, one of those words is precious. Precious, precious, you know what that means? Precious means rare. It's a little odd. Rare. Precious metals, gold, platinum, quickly becoming silver. Why are they precious? Because they're rare. Amen. That little baby, oh, that's precious. Why? Because it's the only one like it. It's rare. Precious. Precious said the word of the Lord was precious in the days of Samuel and there was no open vision. What's he saying? The, Lord, the word of the Lord was rare in the days of Samuel. As a matter of fact, so rare indeed that the child Samuel was the only one hearing from God. 
The sons of Eli and Eli, by omission, had sinned against God. And God wasn't speaking to them anymore. And the only word that came was the word of God to a young boy. And he went on and he said there was no open vision. In this case, that word open vision, it means divine revelation. The word of the Lord was rare in those days and there was no divine revelation. For you see, the sons of Eli had so sinned against God that God wasn't speaking to them anymore. And because he wasn't speaking to them anymore, there was no knowledge of the will and the direction of God. And the sons of Eli had defiled, listen to me, they had defiled the sacrifices. You read about it in the previous chapters. They had defiled the sacrifices. Rather than going by the God-ordained sacrifice, they had, they had stolen the best parts for themselves. They had brought prostitutes right to the door of the tabernacle. There was all sorts of uncleanness and defilement. And God was grieved. And God wasn't speaking to them anymore. And there was no vision from God Almighty. And those precious souls, well-meaning Jews, that brought their sacrifices and offered them, listen to me, this is what's sad, offered their sacrifices, amen, to the sons of Eli. Those sacrifices were defiled and desecrated by the priesthood. And those people walked away in their ignorance, thinking that their sins had been given atonement for, and thinking that their hearts were all right with God. But yet God, in that day before the grace of Jesus Christ, rejected those sacrifices, and those Jews were perishing because the priesthood had lost its... and they weren't even aware. Can I tell you tonight, there's a reason when a man such as Brother Case... Up in the years, a man that should be able to just coast through and coach others. He's preaching his heart out, working himself to death. There's a reason that the Daltons, hey man, are working themselves to death through physical affliction. There's a reason that some two-by-four preacher like me can preach a full evangelistic schedule. There's a reason for it, friend. And I'll tell you what it is. It's because the church has lost her vision. Amen. I want you to know, amen, there's no divine revelation anymore. I want to tell you, friend, there's some cases, amen, where the church, the preachers don't even preach anymore. Amen. It's been a long time since they had a God-anointed Holy Ghost message, amen, to give to the people. Amen. And people come to camp meeting and they just suck it up. We've never heard anything like that. God, have mercy on us. Amen. Camp meeting preaching used to be the norm, Brother Casey, and you know that. Amen. It used to be the norm in our churches, but we haven't heard it in a long time. Amen. Because we're so sick sinned, amen, and lost our vision and died spiritually, amen, that the divine revelation of God isn't coming anymore. In other words, God is not wasting his words, amen, on a people that are hard-hearted and stiff-necked and uncaring about a lost and a dying world. Where there was no vision, people just kept right on perishing, generation after generation after generation. Did I tell you this this afternoon, friend? It's going to repeat itself right here in this generation if we don't get our spiritual eyes open and begin to see souls through the eyes of Jesus Christ. I say, God, God help me. God help me. God 